One more presentation to get to, and that comes from Brett. And Brett, in version 9, uh, many new features that allow Mathematica, Mathematica users to visualize their data in brand new ways. Yes. So the three that we're going to talk about today are the new built-in legends, the unit integration into the visualization functions, and also the new gauges. So we're going to start with the legends. And the main things that I want to focus on for the legends are the built-in automation that we've added for them, their customizability, and the ability to use the legends in scenarios that aren't limited to just graphics, the ability to add them to pretty much anything. So we'll start out by looking at some of the automation. Um, so here we're going to define a data set for a bunch of curves, and we're going to create a list line plot out of that. And we're going to make the curves nice and thick, and we're going to assign labels for each of our four curves, and not very creative labels, but descriptive. Um, so here we go, and we can see that we have our legend over here on the right, and it has picked up the styles for each of our curves. So our fourth curve is a nice dark green, and we've picked up that, that color and that thickness, um, and didn't really have to do anything special for that. Next, we're going to look at list plot. Um, this is just a sample of some of our functions and the built-in automation. Um, so here we have four data sets that are sort of clustered in different regions. And for this one, we're using plot legends goes to automatic, which is going to create sort of placeholder position, um, placeholder text for us. Um, and I can select one of these and start typing. And then I can hit the tab key on my keyboard and move to the next one and easily navigate through all of my legend positions and fill them in manually that way. Also, I want to point out that on my plot, I said that I wanted the plot markers to be automatic, and so it's using distinct shapes for all of the different data sets in addition to the distinct colors. And the legend is picking up those shapes as well as the styles. Accidentally evaluated that twice, but... There we go. So now we're going to look at plot. And the main feature that we're going to look at here is the addition of a special value for plot legends, which is called expressions, in which case the legend is going to look at the functions that were passed into plot and automatically create the legend text from that using the mathematical tr traditional form of those functions. Looking at density plots, we have our function and we're creating a density plot from it. We're using color function to show, to customize the colors and the styles for this. And with a simple plot legends goes to automatic, we're going to automatically create a legend that uses that color function and which has the range correctly go from minus one to one, as is the case for this function. And so if I, say, put a 2 in front of here to change the range, then the legend is going to update accordingly from minus 2 to 2. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and increase my magnification a little bit. Um, and the last bit of automation I want to bring up right now is contour plot. So I'm using the same function and color function as for my density plot example, but contour plot, of course, is not going to create a smooth gradient of colors. It's going to segment them and use a band of red and a band of orange and this sort of thing. And so the resulting legend for that shows us that what the segmented colors are, and it labels some of the um, values between them. It's not showing necessarily all of them. It depends on how many contours there are. When you have a lot of contours, it will filter some of them out to keep this legend from becoming too dense. If you have fewer contours, 
it'll label all the values. But I can look and see that between the value between orange and red is 0.8. <clears throat> And contour plot conveniently has tooltips on all the contours by default. And so if I mouse over the contour for one of the contours between an orange and red region, then I can see that that's also 0.8. So now we're going to look at the customization capabilities of the new legends. The customization is sort of based around specific legend constructors. And the four that we have right now are point legend, which is what we were seeing for list plot, line legend, which is what we were seeing for plot or list line plot, uh, swatch legend, which I haven't shown yet. It's what a lot of the charting functions tend to use, bar charts, that sort of thing, and bar legend, which is what we're using for color functions for both the continuous and discretized versions for density and contour plots. So the syntax for these is for point legend, line legend, and swatch legend is some sort of style specification and what the labels are. And then they take additional options. In this case, I'm saying that the layout, I want to be in sort of a row so that it's a horizontal form uh, for all of them. And we can see our point legend and our line legend and our swatch legend. And then our bar legend in the continuous case <clears throat> at the end. So the automation goes beyond that. I mean, so, so those functions provide the basis for a lot of our automation. And those combine with a, a few additional wrappers such as placed. So I'm going to create my list line plot again, except that I'm going to use placed to position my labels below the, be below the plot instead of on the right-hand side. And the automation is such that it, when it moves the location, it automatically knows that this is probably going to be better as a horizontal layout, and so it's going to switch the layout as well when it moves the positioning. We also have some fairly flexible positioning. We can position the legend inside the graphic using a scaled coordinate system. So we're going to put it four-fifths of the way to the right and one-fifth the way up, so this is going to be in the bottom right corner. And again, we're just using the automatic labels, and they got cut off a little bit by the magnification. And I could still you know, come in here and type and tab between them and so on. We also have control for the size of our markers inside of a legend. So here we're going to use our... Um, plot example with the automatically generated text from the Mathematica formulas. And we're going to use legend marker size to bump up the width so that our line segments that are representational in the legend are wider and more visible. And so this is about twice as wide as it is by default. The legends also have a lot of built-in functionality for adding labels and controlling their styles. So here we're going to create our density plot, and on top of our bar legend, we're going to add a label for our legend, and we're going to control what the style for that is. And so now we see that we have our label at the top, and we've made all of the labels for the um, scale to be a nice, heavy, black, large font. And finally, we have a option, you know, functionality for exerting a lot of control over how things appear. Um, so here I'm going to specify a legend function, which is applied to the legend sort of as a wrapper. Um, so in this case, I'm going to give it a frame, and I'm going to specify a rounding radius so that the corners on that frame are sort of rounded off and not hard and square. Um, and also, in this case, I've specified that I want the, I've specified all for the contours for this contour plot, and now we're picking up all of the contours and not just the automatically filtered ones. So now I'm going to go into an example where we are going to create a legend for something that is very much not um, a graphic. And so we're going to start by creating a table. And I've sort of demagnified this a little bit because the 
immediate contents of the table aren't particularly important. It's the numbers from 1 to 100. And all of the prime numbers I've highlighted in a large red font. Um, and, and so we're going to, and we've stored this into a variable called table. I love creative names. And, um, and we're going to build on that. So now we're going to create a legend that will go with this table. And I'm not using any of the legend constructors, any of the built-in ones. I'm going to do it completely freeform using column and some style wrappers and that sort of thing. Um, so here's my legend, and we have black font for the composite numbers and a large red font for the prime numbers. And now we're going to combine these in different ways. So the simplest way is to just use legended. And I say legended of my table and my legend, and then we get the final result, and it looks beautiful. Um, but what else can we do? So as we did with the plot legends option on the previous slide, we're going to use placed to move the legend. In this case, we've specified a very specific legend, and so we lose the automatic um, transition from a vertical to horizontal um, legend format. <clears throat> but also, we can still position the legend somewhere on top of the gra on top of the object that is to be legended. Um, in this case, I've sort of toned down the table a little bit so that we can see the legend a bit more clearly. Imagine that you know, for some reason your table had a bunch of empty space in this corner because you, know, you have long column labels on the left and row labels on the um, oh, sorry, row labels on the left and column labels on the top, and so you have some empty white space in the top left corner. Um, and so then you can position your, le your legend there. So now we're going to move on to our unit integration for visualization. And this is basically going to fall into sort of three categories. The first is automatically detecting what units we have and visualizing them. The second is going to be using what we know about the units to create labels for axes and frames. And finally, we're going to discuss how to customize what units are used. Um, rather than whatever may be automatically detected. So here I'm going to create a data set. This will take just a moment. And I'm getting the, tem the temperature at the airport down the road for the month of November. And I happen to know that this is coming back in Celsius. And so we're wrapping it in quantity and we're getting some nice uh, temperatures in Celsius for November. Um, and now I just feed this into this line plot. and it plots the data automatically. Uh, so our maximum is near 15 Celsius, and the minimum was about, uh, minus 4 something. And we can see that off of the plot. Now I'm going to get the temperatures for December. And in this case, I'm getting them in um, Fahrenheit to get nice mixture of data to work with. And if I plot the combination of my November and December data, then it's going to, in this case, convert all of those Fahrenheit values into Celsius and plot the Celsius values. <clears throat> and we can see this by including the units on the, as axis labels. And we just say axis label goes to automatic, and it's going to automatically put our label in the top left-hand corner here is degrees Celsius. And I can even mouse over, oh, mouse over it, and it has a little tooltip that gives it in a more explicit spelled out form. So we can also specify exactly what type of labels we want. So here's the same one. I'm going to say that I don't want any um, label on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, I want degrees Celsius. And I want the long form of it without a tooltip or anything. <clears throat> so then here we get the spelled out degrees Celsius as the label for our axis. And of course, we can do the same thing for um, frame labels. In this case, histogram, and it's choosing um, Fahrenheit as the um, units to use from that mixed data set. And I've turned the frame on. 
and we have Fahrenheit down here on the x-axis, which is the appropriate axis for a histogram to show um, for the units. And so now the question is, you know, how do you control which units the plot is going to, the visualization is going to use? And the option for this is target units. By default, it's automatic. We've now seen this plot about three times. Um, and we can see that it's in Celsius. <clears throat> Instead, I can say, I can use target units to say that I want it to be in Fahrenheit. And here we get the Fahrenheit scale. Um, or I, mean, I can even use Kelvins if I like. And you know, we get Kelvin. And so now we're going to move on to the gauges. We're going to take a quick look at the base set of functions that we have for gauges. We're going to look at how we can use the gauges as interactive controls for things and how to customize them. So the basic types of gauges that we have are angular gauge, which is sort of a circular speedometer sort of appearance, and then um, a vertical linear gauge, um, a horizontal linear gauge, and a classic thermometer type appearance. And for all of these, I'm showing the value 42, and that the range is going to go from 0 to 100. You can, of course, specify your own ranges. Um, and these all have little tooltips that additionally tell you what the value is. We also have some specialty gauges. Um, so we have an analog clock built in. And I've made the first argument here dynamic so that it's updating about once a second. Um, I see that it's about 107 champagne time, so I'll keep moving fairly quickly. Um, and the last one, the last specialty gauge that we have is bullet gauge. And this one takes a few more arguments than the other gauges. It's a little bit more complex. We have our primary value, which is 87. That's represented by this red bar here. <clears throat> we have some type of reference value, which is, in this case, 80. And that's represented by this gray marker, which we can see is at 80. <clears throat> and then we have our range with some intermediate points in it that are going to affect the gray shading. So it goes from 0 to 50 in sort of a darker gray, um, 50 to 75 in a medium gray, and 75 to 100 in um, a lighter gray. And these are frequently used for monitoring, say, progress of some process against the previous incantation of that process. So sales this year versus sales last year, and the ranges might represent you know, light gray means, you know, sales in that range and everybody's getting a nice bonus at the end of the year. Uh, sales in the darker gray region and people are perhaps working on their resumes. Um, and so that's an application, for example, of bullet gauges. Um, so now we'll take a quick look at how to use gauges as controls. Um, the simplest way is to just use it within manipulate. And so here I have manipulate. I have a plot function that I want to plot, and I want to control the period on it. And so I'm setting this up as sort of a normal slider type syntax for my variable. And then at the end, I just drop in you know, a horizontal gauge in this case. And I'm creating a pure function out of it. And slot slot says that just provide, you know, take all of the option, you know, all of the arguments that it, um, that slider would normally take. And I'm going to place this on the bottom. And the advantage of using a gauge as a dynamic control in this case instead of, say, slider, is that I get the values displayed directly on the scale. So I can see that I'm at 1, and I can move this up to 3 and see what period 3 looks like, um, and this sort of thing. And you can see as I move it along, my plot is updating nicely and smoothly. and um, it's kind of useful for that sort of thing. You can, of course, use um, gauges outside of manipulate um, using dynamic arguments. <clears throat> so here I'm creating a column, and I have an angular gauge, and I'm going to show some, show some labels on it. And this is tied to a dynamic variable x, and I have that variable also hooked up to a slider, and I have a button that will reset it to 0. And so here we can see the uh, finished product. And as I move the 
needle by clicking it and dragging it. The slider is updating, and as is the value down here in the value display. If I take the slider, the needle is going to update also, and I can hit the button and reset everything back to zero. So the fun thing is that the gauges are not restricted to single values, so if I put a um, list of values in, so here I have two, var two dynamic variables, x and y, and I'm going to start one at zero, start the other at one, um, and I have two sliders and two reset buttons. We'll scroll that on screen. And so now I can drag the red one, and the first slider updates, and then I can drag the blue one, which is tied to Y, and the second slider updates, and I can you know, sort of flip their order around so that what was zero is now one, and what was one is now zero, and I can hit my reset buttons and um, they all sort of update back and forth any way that they sort of work. Um, and so finally I'm going to look at quick glance at the customization for gauges. Um, as an example, I'm going to set a whole bunch of different styles for controlling the frame on a gauge. Um, so I'm going to set the size, the thickness of the frame to 0.2. I'm going to set the element function to something customized. <clears throat> and I'm going to set the style for the frame to be green with no edge form. Um, and so we get sort of a f nice green 3D looking sort of thing here. Um, I'll quickly show the update to the chart element schemes palette for gauges. So using, um, so we switch to the gauges tab and then we have our basic gauge types here. And then we have three choices that we can uh, select from. So we can choose what we want for the marker appearance for the needle. Um, and these tend to have various other controls that we can control different radiuses and what direction the light's coming from and that sort of thing. Um, we can also control the, f the face. And this is going to control basically the background for the gauge. Um, or we can look at the frame and control, you know, Um, so here we're going to look at that bezel sector that we were looking at, and we can change sort of what fraction, the inside slope versus the outside slope, that sort of thing. And of course we could insert the uh, final option setting and use that within our gauge. <clears throat> so the last two customizations I want to look at are the ability to specify scale ranges, which will highlight along the axis. So here we've set everything to blue and we're using a light blue from 60 to 80, uh, sort of a medium blue from 80 to 90, and a dark blue from 90 to 100. And some built-in labeling for our gauges. So we've already seen when we were looking at some of the dynamic behaviors, the built-in, the ability to say gauge labels goes to automatic and have it display a numeric value in addition to the re uh, visual representation. We can also support units within gauges, and if I say full, then we'll get the numeric value and the unit, in this case inches. And I've also specified a freeform label for this example, which is height. And just wanted to point out, you know, sort of these all sort of position themselves nicely, um, where there's a bit of space and in some traditional locations and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's the gauges. Certainly some fun ways to visualize data in Mathematica 9 and a few follow-up questions for you, Brad. Uh, let's go back to legends. Yeah, sure. How can I get the items in a legend to match the order of my data? Okay, so this is an excellent question. Um, so, and this is sort of, my first example is an excellent example of this. Um, so we have our curves and it sort of happens that the later data sets are larger than the earlier ones and so the automatic legend um, layout is sort of backwards from the plot. Um, and, and, and so in this case, I'm going to go back to, say, my line legend wrapper. And I'm going to use the legend layout, uh, not legend label, legend layout. And I'm just going to say reversed and add a closing bracket. 
Um, and then that's going to flip the ordering of the legend so that it matches what my visualization is using. A very easy way to do that. And another quick question. Uh, how can I make the lines in a legend have the same dashing as my plot? This is another excellent question. Um, so currently the... Um, I'm not sure if I can select into this to show this nicely, but basically there are several graphics in, say, this plot. Um, let's go down to the plot one. It'll be a little bit easier. Um, so if I say plot style goes to dashing of 0 0.05 and dashing of 0 0.01 and I put my option in the wrong spot. So we'll just move that over to the end. So we've got nice dashed curves, but they're not reflecting in the legend very well. Um, and, and the reason for this is that dashing by default is using a scaled coordinate system. And so the five in this case is representing 5% of the width from the left end of this graphic to the right edge of this graphic. And it's doing the same thing for the little graphics that are building up the legend. It's just that they sort of get so small that they run together. Um, and, and so there are a couple ways of dealing with this. One is to use absolute sizes for the dashing. Um, so if I switch this to absolute dashing and say I want this to be five points or so, then we get our dash. Let's bump this up to about 10 and it'll be about what it was before. And we can see that that's reflected in that. Um, this is a case where you want, might want to also use legend marker size to make that line sample wider um, so that you can see more of the dashing pattern. Um, also, if you use, I believe, the named sizes, these also sort of go into an absolute mode. Um, and then that will also show up well in the legend. Great. And as always, if you want to find sample code or some examples to use for your new legends or your new gauges, head to the Documentation Center, find some guide pages there as well, or also check out wolfram.com mathematica.